Hello, I'm Dr. Sheila Dowd. I'm a psychologist at Rush University Medical Center. Thank you for the opportunity to present our study on sleep quality and the outcome of exposure therapy in adults with social anxiety. I'm gonna go ahead and shrink myself so I don't get in the way of my slides. So this was a larger project designed by Jasper Smith, Stefan Hoffman, Mark Pollack, and Michael Otto. We were looking at how DCS might impact learning and exposure therapy. Alison Zalta and I had been exploring how sleep quality might be affecting our therapeutic interventions. And with the help of sleep expert, Daniel Taylor, Christy Dutcher took the lead with her mentor, Jasper Smith, their research coordinator, Alex Peroni, and the data expert, David Rosenfield. We explored a subset of this data from that larger NIH project. I just wanna report that I consult with the Wellness Network and have some research grants outside of the submitted work. So as providers, we've all seen how poor sleep impacts our patients and perhaps seen how it affects us and our children as well. We wanted to further understand this impact. So our study focused on poor sleep in those with social anxiety, which has been less frequently studied as compared to other anxiety disorders. Specifically, we had the opportunity to see how sleep might impact an exposure-based CBT intervention that requires learning and memory consolidation. So let's do a quick review of the sleep, sleep literature. So we know impairments in sleep have been shown to affect our ability to reason logically and focus and sustain attention. We know that sleep increases cognitive flexibility and helps us problem solve, mainly because we're better at incorporating the new information, which consequently helps us to be more flexible and adaptive. And it helps us to connect memories and use them effectively. As it applies specifically um, to an exposure-based CBT, right, we have sleep difficulties influencing memory consolidation pro processes, which might impact the fear extinction that's a key component to CBT and in our particular study for CBT and social anxiety. So we know specifically sleep deprivation has been shown to impair extinction, decrease extinction retention, and reduce the ability to generalize extinction learning. So to continue this line of thinking, because a good night's sleep before learning facilitates learning, we of course wondered if a patient's or client's bad night's sleep compromises their ability to learn or commit the exposure experience to memory, or does the sleep deprivation impede kind of forming those new memories of the emotional content in that session? As I said before, we had this great opportunity uh, to assess this in a larger study, which was examining whether uh, decycloserine, which is a partial NMDA receptor agonist, whether that could potentially augment fear learning and enhance exposure therapy outcomes for social anxiety disorder. Just real quickly, we know DCS from the animal literature is found to reverse the negative impact of sleep deprivation. It's also been studied with uh, adults with similar results in improvement in enhanced new learning before a declarative learning task. But it was not found to mitigate the negative effects of sleep disturbance for social anxiety disorder in a smaller study of ours. So we had another opportunity was to assess if baseline lower self-reported sleep quality would be associated with less treatment gains and higher symptoms, both at the end of treatment and then again at follow-up. We also wanted to examine if that self-reported sleep quality and duration, both before and after a, a designated therapy session would be associated with worst symptoms at that next session when we controlled for the symptoms at that designated session. And then lastly, we wanted to study whether DCS could moderate the relationship between both sleep quality and sleep duration with the treatment outcome. So the larger study um, was multi-centered, um, double-blind, randomized control trial, UT Austin, Boston University, and at Rush in Chicago. We used data in this study for 105 of the 152 participants in the larger study. Um, 
After the baseline evaluation, participants came in for a five week, 90 minute group therapy session using exposure therapy protocol. The first session was focused on psychoeducation, uh, kind of on the role of exposure therapy. And then the remaining sessions involved an anxiety exposure with participants completing a speech. The videos were also used to help the learning process. So we used fear ratings assessed with the SUDs or the subjective units of distress scale. And the goal was to give the opportunity to induce that fear response while giving a speech, the chance kind of for it to run its course while staying with the speech and not avoiding with the goal to kind of violate that harm expectancy that we find in social anxiety and learning to occur with both the video, group feedback and practice. It's a challenging intervention, but it's very effective. Um, we have several outcome measures, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the Consensus Sleep Diary, and then we use the standard Leibowitz social anxiety scale, which is a very easy scale to administer. The social phobic disorder severity form as kind of that secondary assessment of social anxiety. And then the MADRAS, which is a rating of depression, was used as a covariate. So here are the um, baseline assessments, right? The mean age of our sample was 29. We had 84 men and 68 women participate. Participants were in the range of marked to severe social anxiety, as you can see from the LSAS. They were mildly depressed, as shown with the madras. And 56% of the sample were identified as poor sleepers. And that was using that P PSQI. Here are the weekly assessments, both pre and post sessions. You can see the impact of the sessions on the Leibowitz social anxiety scale, as well as the social phobia scale. And then the pre and post sessions of sleep quality, you can see throughout both um, total sleep time as well as assess sleep quality. In the first analysis of how low sleep quality might be associated with less treatment gains and higher symptom severity, we did find poor self-reported sleep quality is related to significantly slower improvement over time and worse symptom outcome at the end of treatment and at the three month follow-up. In this figure, you can see the slope of symptom change for the participants with the low um, PSQI being in red. And that would be those subjects whose total scores were one standard deviation below. And then the high, which is identified with the blue line, are those subjects with a total PSQI score, one deviation above the mean. As you can imagine, as a clinician, this kind of tells us that there might be other impacts on our sessions and there might be a possible reason for slow or poor response in the people that you're working with. Now the PSQI does take some time to administer and, and to score, but it might be something you would consider including in your intakes or at baseline. Then as you notice poor response than you expected, you could potentially assess their sleep. Another great option to assess sleep would be to use our own patients' watches. All the new technology, there's lots of opportunity for them to use their personal exercise tracking or monitoring devices to also track their sleep. If your patients don't have one of those um, watches or the PSQI is too long to incorporate into your practice or other shorter scales, this is the SQS. Um, it's only one question and, it, and it's shown favorable validity and reliability. So again, this might be an option for you to quickly assess sleep. Now taking a look at our second hypothesis that self-reported sleep quality and duration both before and after a designated therapy session would be associated with worse symptoms at the subsequent session we conducted two analyses. 
So in looking both at sleep quality and sleep time with treatment outcome the night prior to the exposure therapy sessions, we found no significant effects of pre-session sleep quality and no effects of post-session sleep quality on the next session symptom outcome. And this was surprising because of our previous study, which found self-identified restedness the night after treatment did predict lower symptoms at the start of the next treatment session. But this may be because the sense of restedness differs from the measure of sleep quality. In the second set of analyses for hypothesis two, we were looking at that sleep diary total sleep time the night prior to and after all the exposure sessions as a predictor of symptom severity at the next session. Um, we did find that participants who had higher levels of total sleep time before the exposure session had lower symptoms at the next session. Also deviations from their average level of pre-session total sleep time were related to symptoms at the next session. This finding, however, was only found at the final session, so it may not represent an effect or may not be evidence of an additive effect. But this finding is consistent with the notion that pre-therapy sleep has an important role in next day therapeutic learning. And it's also consistent with studies of fear conditioning and extinction paradigms. So it is possible that new learning in the session was impaired if, this, if the patient was sleeping less. And then finally, for the last hypothesis, we added the interaction between the DCS condition and sleep quality or total sleep time as a predictor of symptom severity at the next therapy session, but none of the interactions or main effects involving DCS were significant. And even the largest uncorrected effect size was only slightly greater than a small effect size. These findings were aligned with previous work, but it is possible we might need a larger sample size to detect the effects or that those mechanisms underlying DCS and the sleep impact treatment outcomes differently. So just to quickly review our limitations, we didn't have an evaluation of pre-existing sleep disorders or a baseline sleep assessment. We also only used self-report measures of sleep and did not look at the circadian effects of the timing of the session. So in conclusion, we do see support for high rates of sleep disturbance among patients seeking treatment for social anxiety. And our findings point to the critical importance of delineating the distinct roles of sleep before therapy and after therapy and their effects on interrupting the efficacy of exposure-based CBT. It is possible that sleep disrupts exposure therapy through other mechanisms like reducing cognitive reappraisal abilities, but either way, implementing assessment and interventions targeting poor sleep before and throughout therapy may help us maximize our outcomes for social anxiety. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, take a look at the full article published in 2020 in Depression and Anxiety. Thank you again.